Brian received his PhD at the University of Missouri-Columbia and is an assistant professor now in Africana Studies. He's just joined us this fall, specializing in African-American literature of the 20th century with a primary focus on the Harlem Renaissance and a secondary focus on digital cultures, which we'll be seeing in a moment, too. He has published many articles on his research project, Visual Harlem, and has presented at locations around the world, including Paris and other marvelous places. His research focuses on advanced visualization and how sustained and varied digital communication affects student retention and student engagement in literature courses taught both online and face-to-face. -face. His title, which I find wonderful for today, is There's an App for That, The Evolution of Humanities. So please welcome Brian Carter. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here today. I, I really appreciate you either coming or staying around. I know it's very late, uh, but I definitely appreciate your presence. Thank you also, Dean, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this and for the organizing committee. You guys have done a fantastic job so far, and I, I love the event uh, up to this point. So thank you very much. Um, I think it's very important that as we begin to talk about uh, this, this uh, technology that I, that I incorporate into my literature class, that we establish a baseline, and we have to make sure that we are all on the same page with regards to some very uh, basic concepts before we begin to even get into what I'm talking about regarding digital humanities. And I think it's important that we, first of all, of course, make sure that we all understand that basic definition of the humanities. Um, and I'll make sure I try and stay in my microphone here as well. And of course, we know that the humanities are basically those disciplines that study the human condition uh, using both an our analytical, critical, and speculative uh, forms of, of, of analysis. We know that those disciplines include uh, uh, topics as such as uh, ancient and modern languages, literature, history, philosophy, uh, visual and performing arts, as well as communication studies. Collectively, we're known as humanists, and the idea being that, that we use these disciplines, disciplines to understand ideas and cultures and experiences outside of our own. Because as a result of that, it's suggested that, that humanists, scholars and, and students, develop a, a, a consciousness that is perhaps more suited to maybe this multicultural world in which we currently exist. Now some feel that the humanities are under attack, under threat, because of the various cutbacks that are happening in higher education, programs being eliminated, budget cuts, etc. And I believe, I really truly believe in my heart that digital humanities can serve as a means to perhaps rethink the humanities in some very interesting ways. Offering a different perspective for scholars who, who wish to excite a brand new uh, generation of, of learners about the field. And it's enabling these new learners brand new opportunities, exciting opportunities to express their understanding in very innovative ways. Digital humanities is a means by which the humanities can be re-explored with brand new sets of tools. Tools that are constantly being developed and that are evolving on a daily basis almost, which offer new and fresh understandings of very classic ideas. This, this unprecedented access to increasingly large data sets of information also plays a part within the study of digital humanities. For instance, I just got an email yesterday that there is a, a brand new launch of a, a Digital Public Library of America. I'm not sure if many of you have heard about that or not. The site is launching in 2013, and it's actually going to be a, 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 a amalgamation of, uh, of a number of different libraries and, and media sources that will be made available digitally, of course. Now, I know that brings up a number of issues that we can maybe get into in the Q&A with regards to things like access and the digital divide, but, but just the fact that, that NEH and, and, and NSF is supporting initiatives like this, I think is, is quite an interesting move. Now, the ideas and methods used within the digital humanities, which, which tie it to information technologies, enable us uh, to have some imaginative possibilities, which include using technology as a tool, using technology as a study object, using technology as an expressive medium, as an exploratory laboratory, and as an activist 
venue. So throughout this week, we've been experiencing some amazing presentations. And interestingly enough, there are and will be, or have been and will be, a variety of those which actually touch on or are touched by the digital humanities, whether, whether the presenters actually bring that to the surface or not. For instance, on Monday, we had personality politics. And interestingly enough, Technology was actually used as an activist venue, whether it be through YouTube or whether it be through Twitter. Interestingly enough, although that wasn't necessarily the focus of that particular presentation. On Tuesday, we had some students that, that showed some amazing videos dealing with, with language learning and, 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 and creating videos within these languages. And that was, of course, technology as an expressive medium or as a tool. Earlier today, we had uh, uh, listen closely, and, 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 and we, we, we could look at technology as a tool, an expressive medium, as we heard those voices, those weird voices, as well as, interestingly enough, an activist venue. When we look at the voices that, that many hip-hop artists uh, incorporate, they use that as a part of their activism. Whether or not we even understand all of that which they're saying, that's part of the activism that's actually embedded in those, in those sounds that they're making. Thursday, we're going to be looking at the technological sublime and a means memory. Technology is a tool, an expressive medium, an activist venue, and even an exploratory laboratory. I can't wait to hear those presentations then. And on Friday, we'll be looking at languages explored and technology as an expressive medium, of course. So when you think about this, for the, and, and, and for the sake of time, uh, and for the stated objectives of this particular presentation, there's an app for that. I'm going to be focusing on various applications or tools that I either have used in almost all of my literature class prior to coming here, am currently using in my present literature class, which is taught online, or plan to use in my spring classes, which I think will give you some interesting uh, ideas with regards to how we can take off-the-shelf applications and focus them on, 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 on particular dis disciplines. Now before I show you a few of these apps, I really have to share with you my, my personal pedagogy with regards to uh, the digital humanities and these tools, because I think it's important that, that we realize that as, as instructors, the worst mistake that we can possibly make is just to take a piece of technology and use it in class without a real reason for doing so. I think the most successful uses of, 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 of technology in the classroom either answer a question or are used to enhance some aspect of the class in some way, shape, or form. That being said, uh, we're going to focus on enhanced communications in the, uh, in the applications that you're going to see. Technology used as a tool as well as an expressive medium. We're going to focus on enhanced visualization, which I think you'll find to have some very interesting uh, uh, possibilities with regards to things that you can find in, in the App Store, whether it's Android or iOS, uh, for those of you that have either one platform or the other, or even uh, tools that, that deal with more desktop or laptop technologies, mobile versus uh, stationary. Um, as well as uh, uh, this, this sort of expressive medium. And then we're going to look at increased access to data sets. Because as we look at some of the applications that are being developed, we have some amazing, unprecedented access to information and data that we've never had before just a few years ago. Information that's out there that sometimes people don't necessarily know is there, but when we see these, this, these bits of information that we can perhaps use in our classrooms, I think you'll find some, some very interesting possibilities going on here. Now one of the first applications that I'm going to show you, and I'll try to make sure that I, I stay very focused with regards to my time because I do have quite a bit to do here and, and hopefully we'll get through all of them. Um, one of the first applications I'll show you is one that I'm currently using in my class. And this also feeds into, once again, my, my sort of personal pedagogy with regards to uh, online education. Now, of course, many of you know how online education has evolved over the years. Many of you know that, of course, the, the, the traditional type of online education is really an evolution of the old correspondence courses. 
the ones where you know we used to get the things mailed and uh, you'd fill out the information, take your assessment, and mail it back, and, and wait patiently for the for the mailman to deliver your grades back to you. That that asynchronous uh, uh, sort of experience is how many of the current online courses have basically evolved. When you look at the use of a course management system, whether it be Blackboard or D2L or Angel or one of the many others that are out there, you have to keep in mind that usually, not always, but typically, the online courses are developed so that students really have very little interaction, real-time interaction with their professors. They take care of their coursework. They usually do that singularly. They submit their assignments by a deadline date and they wait patiently for their grades to be submitted to the, the grading system so they can see what those are. So interestingly enough, I, I, I didn't think that that was the most effective way to, to reach out to our students, to engage our students. And so I started looking around many years ago for a real-time uh, um, uh, mode of communication, a way that I would be able to, uh, to reach my students in ways that perhaps had not necessarily been done before. Sometimes I have students in my classes that the, their phones ring and I just say, that's okay, we'll just wait, so it's no problem. <laughs> so so when, I, when I wanted to reach out to my students in real time, I wanted them to experience something that was very similar to a face-to-face -face classroom experience. This was very foreign to many of our students. I wanted them to experience deadlines that were, that were mixed up during the week. I wanted to, them to experience maybe perhaps doing presentations in an online environment once again, this was something that was relatively foreign to them, and it took my students a while to, to kind of grasp a hold to, to how interesting a course like this could be. So I, saw, I found a number of applications, and, and I've used a number of them, that, that some work very well, and some have various capabilities, and others don't work very well. One that I've been using this semester is called Spreecast. And I had two students that, that volunteered to be here this evening uh, that I, I'd like to bring on air here in just a moment. One of the reasons why I chose this application is because, number one, it's free. I thought that was a really interesting thing uh, for all of its capabilities. Number two, it's off the shelf. So in addition to the students creating an account here, they can also create the same kind of broadcast that I'm doing with them right now. So they're learning a skill that they can take with them outside of the classroom instead of maybe introducing them to something that they would probably never see again once they graduated from this institution. And then thirdly, this has some really cool or, or, uh, um, uh, capabilities that are evolving almost on a daily basis. For instance, I, I came into the office this morning and excitedly told one of my colleagues, guess what, tell us, uh, this, this, this program, Spreecast, just introduced the possibility of, 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 of putting a live YouTube or a, a streaming YouTube uh, video directly into your, into your, your broadcast. And you can, you can stream and, and, and broadcast PowerPoint presentations right into your broadcast, so it's, it's, it's more seamless. And he was like, man, this program is pretty good for it being free, right? And so uh, Jeremy's telling me here that he had to rent a MacBook uh, <laughs> to make sure his camera was working. So we'll see if we can get him working. Now, one of the other capabilities of this application was that we're able to bring students online here, and they can actually become a part of the broadcast which I thought was a really interesting possibility. Seamless, and you can see it was just a mouse click. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, introduce you to Karina Martinez. And Karina, uh, earlier today, I, I sent out a message uh, to the class and asking if you could basically respond to uh, our use of technology in the classroom and maybe some of the tools that we've used in our class and, and, and basically what you think of them. So if you wanna go ahead and address that, that would be fantastic. Um, well, I think personally that when we have our chat online during the week, I think the fact that it's more personal and that you're engaging with us and explaining what we need in one class, it makes it more interesting and it helps me retain the information and also be able to answer my questions so I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and get it from what I'm supposed to be learning and I, that makes it a lot easier. And so, kind of like the classroom setting but not taking the time to have to drive to class and if you're parking and get to class, it's, it's, to me it's a lot easier and, and it makes class a lot more interesting. And I've taken 
more information in this class than some of my other online classes just because you're able, it's like you're talking to me in front of me and we're having a conversation, but you're actually teaching me. And I think it's a lot more interesting that way. Well, cool, thank you. Um, let's see if we can bring Jeremy on. Uh, I'm not sure if his camera's gonna be working, but we'll see what happens here. It wasn't working earlier, but uh, oh, there he is. Hey, Jeremy. So uh, let's see if we can uh, bring you on air here. And uh, Jeremy, how's it going? I see uh, you're, are, are you in Best Buy or something, or what? Uh, I'm actually in the U of A library right now, so uh, I might be getting angry at, from the students surrounding me, but I'll do my best to uh, you know keep my voice down and be still clear to, to answer your question. Well, cool. Well, Jeremy, why don't you address that idea of uh, what, what, what does this technology do to our literature, for our literature class? What do you think? Well, I mean, I think that you know I've taken other online courses before, for, and you know, it's primarily you get the syllabus that lets you know what you're supposed to read, and then it tells you when the quizzes and tests are. And you know, I thought that I enjoyed that, and I was a little intimidated with this format before class started. But um, you know, as the semester has progressed, and we've gotten the chance to have these online courses with you, um, it's made the material so much more interesting to hear your personal opinion on a weekly basis. You know, as many times as we want to, if we want to come in twice a day on Monday or, you know, twice a day on Wednesday or, you know, once a week we get the chance to interact with you, you know, voice our opinion about certain things, but also get, um, excuse me for picking my nose right there on camera. <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize I'm on camera right now. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the point is, is that, you know, you get tremendous feedback. So it's just like having a lecture. You get all the benefits and all the freedom of taking an online court where you know you can study on your own time and uh, you know not feel the burdens of you know certain class periods, but also you get the the, the benefit of, um, of of interacting with you on a personal level. And um, you know I think that uh, Spreecast is something I would never have known about uh, if I had not taken this course. So you know I'm, I'm very happy and I do know about it now. Well, cool. Thank you both, uh, Jeremy and Karina. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you both taking time out of your schedules to be here outside of our, our scheduled meeting times. I've got a few other applications I'm going to be uh, demonstrating, but uh, do Karina or do G you, Jeremy, have any other sort of last thoughts? And you, you're more than welcome to stick around if you like, because I'll leave the broadcast up and running. But do you have any last thoughts before I uh, turn over to some other applications? Uh, Karina, do you want to say something first? I Sure. Um, I think that I hope I'm hoping that you can stick with these types of things, and maybe um, other teachers and instructors will also want to maybe do like spreecasts and stuff because I think it helps a lot better and it makes the class more interesting, in my opinion. Cool. Thank you, Jeremy. Anything? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I always have something more to say. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I think this is the future of um, you know um, internet courses in general, and you know bringing together people from far distances um, and being able to connect on personal levels like this. You know, so I think that uh, you know this is only going to evolve further. And um, you know, I'm thrilled about this and you know the video cast and the audio cast that we do. All those types of uh, technology that we use in our class. And I'm sure you're going to go over. Um, later on, um, you know, it's 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 all beneficial to just you know the further evolving of our technological uh, society that we live in. Well, cool. Well, I, once again, thank you both. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and, and take you both out there. And you guys are the <laughs> Great. Uh, so once again, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate both of you being here. I'm going to move on to some other applications because I think that as we begin to look at at, at what's available on the desktop. Uh, you know, of course, we have to deal with whether or not applications are running Flash, like Spreecast, and if you have an iOS device, of course, it's very difficult to use certain applications that are doing live broadcasts like this. I will show you a couple that will work uh, on, a, on, a, on a laptop, or I'm sorry, on a, on a tablet here in just a few moments. But before I move away from my desktop or from my laptop machine, I would like to show you an audio broadcasting application that I found to be very, very interesting. As I began to, to do these live broadcasts for my students, I began to think about accessibility issues. And I thought that it was really important that, that yes, we can do all these live broadcasts, but, but what about those students that perhaps have, have hearing difficulties? Uh, what about those students that have other uh, challenges that perhaps they may not necessarily be able to fully participate using one sense or the other? So as I started to look for other applications, I found a really interesting one called iPadio. 
Now, what iPadio does is it's a, 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 an audio streaming application. They're actually coming out with a video version of this pretty soon, and I'm on the beta, beta tester list. I can't wait. I'm so excited about this. I can't wait till it comes out. But um, uh, the, the audio version of this is really quite interesting because you can broadcast live from your mobile device iPhone, Android device, as well as uh, I believe there's even a Windows uh, version of this as well. Uh, so you can broadcast live and you're given a specific code that you, you type in a num uh, an 800 number, toll free number, you type in your code and then you are live broadcasting. You can embed that live broadcast into a website or into a blog site so that anyone that wants to hear the live audio cast, they can tune into your blog or website and they can listen to that live. They can go to your I, iPadio page and listen to your live broadcast if they want. But the really interesting thing about this application is that it automatically transcodes what you say into text for you. So as you're speaking, it takes maybe uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes after you finish the broadcast and it will then transcode everything that you're saying. Now, now granted, machine translation sometimes is a little bit you know, strange and, it, and it's just kind of interesting. But if you follow along with this transcript, you'll see what I'm talking about here. All right, well, welcome everybody. Today is October 1st, and I can't wait to get going today. Uh, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and thank you all for, once again, taking time off your schedules, Adelaide, Karina, and Natalie, uh, to attend this live session. And it, it keeps going down. So people can subscribe to this, they can follow you, and it's actually not too bad. You can actually go in and edit that transcript if you do see some blaring uh, sort of uh, mistakes that you really want to correct. So that audio to text translation or transcoding is really quite interesting. Um, and I like iPadio because you can broadcast on a Wi-Fi network or a 3G network. So the really funny thing is uh, last year I went to a, um, a, a pumpkin festival for the first time in a really small town in, in mid-Missouri. I'd never been there before, but this thing was huge. And I just had to live broadcast this. So I, I started live broadcasting and, and, and talking about some of the interesting people that I was running into out there. And it was really quite funny that a few of my students actually got the tweet saying that I had started a live audio cast. And they tuned in, and they started sending back comments that I was reading on my phone, like, oh, Dr. C, you're at the Pumpkin Festival. Oh, no. Watch out. For, you know, Don't eat the fried uh, Twinkies, or whatever the case might be. So it was really quite interesting. So iPadio, a free application, once again, is one of those that I always like to introduce my students to, to give them the, uh, the opportunity to maybe incorporate some of this kind of technology into what they're doing. I'm going to very quickly change over from my laptop machine over to my uh, tablet right here. And if you'll just give me a second to make these connections, we'll go ahead and move on from here. All right. So as we're, as we're looking at, at the possibility of, of, of doing some very similarly interesting things from a tablet. We know that tablets are, are becoming more and more powerful every day. In fact, Apple just announced yesterday that next week they're going to be introducing their iPad mini, I think it's probably going to be called, iPad baby, whatever, I don't know what it's going to be called, a seven inch form factor perhaps. Uh, we know that the retina display, iPad 3, is amazing. It's like reading a, a glossy magazine. The processors in these things and, and, the, and the graphic and networking capabilities are simply astounding. I mean, you're carrying around, you know, some, some, some true horsepower with you. That being said, you can do some really amazing things with these particular devices. For instance, one of the very interesting applications I always like to demonstrate here is um, one that allows me to continue doing uh, these live kinds of broadcasts right from my, my, uh, my, my, my tablet device. One of them that I introduced to a number of um, uh, French students last year was called, or is called, Keek. And Keek is one of those uh, social networking applications that I, that I like to introduce my students to, to let them know that there is a life outside of Facebook. 
there's actually a life outside of Twitter, and there are these other smaller social networks that focus perhaps more so on, on video or audio, and they, they live in their own little sort of microcosm of, of individuals who only communicate that way. Well, after introducing a number of, of, uh, of my students in, in, in Paris, actually, to this particular technology, let me show you some of the things that, that they had to say uh, about using this. Hello everyone, I'm Sabrine. I'm using this application for my e-commerce class. I'm kind of discovering uh, many applications um, in the cloud and that's it. I guess you're using it as well and I hope you like kick <laughs> and that's it. See you, bye bye. So the idea behind a lot of these kinds of applications, and let me tell you, there are literally dozens of them, are short form factor video posts. So as we have gotten more so used to the short form factor textual posts, the microblogs like Twitter and, 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 and some others, short form factor video is also becoming very, very popular. And, and I think it's really quite interesting that when you, when you start to think about how you could possibly use this in a classroom, well, imagine how by introducing your students to this, this is cross-platform, iOS, Android, and there's a desktop version of it. So there's almost no excuse for not being able to post a response to, say, an author that we happen to be studying, or a question that you might ask your class everyone subscribing to everyone else's Keek posts and being able to reply back to that person in a mobile setting is really quite interesting and it makes the classroom come alive in a very, very different way. So I think Keek is, is just one of those many other applications that, we might, uh, that you might at, at some point examine. There's another application that does audio broadcasting as well and it's called Spreaker. Uh, my, my, my colleague back here, um, I, um, Ken, always teases me because I've, I've always had these sort of uh, 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 latent kind of, um, uh, uh, I guess, um, uh, wishes that I, or dreams to become a DJ. And uh, I, I told uh, Ken that one time, and he's always teased me about that ever since. Well, uh, Spreaker is one of those free applications that allows you to do that right online. You can upload a playlist. You can actually either DJ from your mobile device, or you can go to the desktop version or the web version of this, and you can actually mix and, and, and auto-tune your, your, your songs. You can do voiceover, and people can tune in live. What this does, as well as what all these applications do, is that they automatically record, or you can selectively record that which you're broadcasting for later playback. So it's really quite interesting that when you introduce students to this, the live broadcast that they come up with is really quite interesting. It's, it's it, you know, you can put partners together and you can have them, you know, assigned to, 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 to speak on a topic and, and we'll all tune in for your live broadcast, whatever time it happens to be, or we'll listen to the recording in some interesting ways. So at some point, you might try out Spreaker. In my opinion, the audio quality of Spreaker is much more interesting than, or I guess much more effective than, than that of, um, of, of uh, uh, iPadio. Let me just show you what that sounds like very quickly. So I cre yeah, created a show, and then uh, you create episodes within your show, and you can see here that the free version allows you to broadcast up to 30 minutes. So uh, I've done a few of these just this semester. You're listening to Spreaker Web Radio. Today is October 1st, and I can't wait to get going today. Uh, I hope you all had a fantastic weekend, and thank you all for, once again, taking time out of your schedules, Adelaide, Karina, and Natalie, uh, to attend this live session. Of course, I'll try to keep it under an hour, hopefully right around 45 minutes. Okay, and so typically what I do during these live broadcasts is I will do something called simulcasting. I'm broadcasting on, on, a, on, on a, uh, the video broadcasting application, I'm broadcasting on two audio applications, so that regardless of how students want to consume that, or interact with that, or engage that particular class, they have a number of options. The fact that these are free, and I introduce those at the beginning of the semester, really gives students some, some very interesting opportunities to do some fun things with their presentations. Now, speaking of presentations, I think it's really quite interesting that when you start to look at how students are doing presentations, I mean, in traditional classrooms, we sometimes require that. Sometimes, however, what we find is that students are 
doing a presentation, they're reading off the PowerPoint, unless of course we told them not to do that. But sometimes, they, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they're tempted to do that, that fall back on that which is comfortable. And sometimes that can be a reading of a PowerPoint. But when you put them in these maybe unfamiliar territories, it brings out, I think, a very different level of, of creativity in them. When they can mix their music in, when they can bring in guest speakers, when they can uh, do some things maybe out in the field, so to speak, a virtual field trip where they're, they're organizing this thing and they're broadcasting live from some, from some real-time location really makes the, uh, the experience quite different. Now, as you'll see here in this particular window, these are a number of other live broadcasting applications that we just don't have time to talk about today that at some point you might want to check out on your own. There's Ustream, the old standard that's been around for a long time. I stopped using Ustream because they incorporate these 30 second commercials every now and then that sometimes disrupts the flow of class. I don't see those as the broadcaster, but the students sometimes see those, uh, those commercials, so to speak. You can pay for a non-commercial version, but uh, sometimes as an assistant professor, we just don't have the budget to do that. There's Livestream that also does the same thing. Uh, it, it, the video quality is fantastic, and both of these have mobile versions, either from your iPhone, your Android device, or your tablet. You can broadcast live from the field using a 3G or a Wi-Fi network. Kink, of course, you've seen. Clip, another one of those social video networks or, or social networks that uses video that's actually very, very good. Justin TV, you've seen iPadio. Vidal is a brand new one, just came out about three months ago. Bamboozer is amazing. There's a beautiful iPad version of this that allows you to broadcast directly from your iPad. The cool thing about Bamboozer is that you can embed that video window right into your blog site or your website to include D2L. So if you wanted to do these directly from your mobile device or from your desktop, there's an embed code, a little block of code that you copy and paste and put right into your, uh, your web presence. That makes it very, very easy for students to access your broadcast. Kick video is really quite interesting. The differentiation between Kick and some of these others is that it also incorporates a point-to-point -point video conferencing system, very similar to Skype. So if your students are signing up for Kick, you can also hold online office hours using an application like that. Once they've signed in, you get a notification that this person's online, they can call you and you've got two-way video going on, very similar to Skype maybe even in some cases a little bit better video quality. Social Cam and Spreaker, you've already seen both of those, they are excellent. Now when you start to think about some of the other capabilities, the, the app for that, so to speak, I think it's important that we look at some of the other ways that, that applications can be used for communication. And remember that that idea of enhancing communication is always very important and the idea of increasing opportunities for those with, with various challenges in their lives. One application that I, I found to be very, very interesting is one called Verbally. Now, I've not had any students that had any communication uh, uh, difficulties yet, but what I have found is that if I ever do, this would be an application that I would introduce to them. So, for instance... Can I only you feel Thanks. Can I only you feel thanks? I know that didn't make very much sense, but look at the possibilities of something like this for someone who may have some, some speech difficulties or may have difficulties communicating. You can not only have them, uh, you know, maybe communicate with you this way, there are phrases that are already pre-built here. You can actually also record whatever you're doing. So they can record, say, a presentation, or at least a portion of one. It might, might sound a little bit different to their classmates, but imagine those, that, that, that liberating sense of communication that someone who maybe was in a class that couldn't do this before is now able to do some very interesting <coughs> things with, uh, with, with their communication. Now, as we look at those, uh, those, those increased numbers of data sets, and I think that part of the digital humanities, part of the beauty of the digital humanities is being able to access all of this new data that's been funded by some outside organization has been put into an absolutely beautiful interface, but allows us to access that through our tablet device, our mobile device, or what have you. 
one of the best applications I've seen, and I think this is absolutely gorgeous, you'll see what I mean here in just a moment, is an app by the New York Public Library. Some of you may have seen this before. So when you think about this, 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 this application called Biblion, it allows you to go into uh, information that is housed at the New York Public Library and be able to, you know, just, just access that in just some amazing ways. You can scroll through this information. You can click on anything that you like. You can get more information by scrolling through the images, reading information here. So, you know, imagine being able to put students, this in the hands of students, and, and, and encourage them to incorporate some or much of this information into, say, a presentation where this is used in order to support whatever it is that they're talking about. So instead of it being a PowerPoint or something that they have to read from, they are referring to this and they're using that in support of whatever it is that they might happen to be doing as a part of their presentation. Another really cool data set that I was just introduced to here not more than maybe two months ago or so is called the Blue Note. How many of you are into jazz out here? Yeah. Have any of you I seen this application before? Yeah. It's, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and so this is one where if you don't know very much about jazz, uh, but if you are interested in it, if you want to learn about it, you can actually learn about anybody you want here. There are extensive biographies of various jazz artists. There are clips that you can hear of their music that is, is really quite interesting. You can play um, little bits of uh, music from, say, Art Blakely. Let's see if that's going to play for us. Maybe not. Let's try another one. nothing about these artists, but you're interested in jazz, you know that jazz is something that maybe you should know a little bit more about or what have you. This is a fantastic application. Of course, they charge for the full version of that. You only get these little clips. You can subscribe, I think it's $1.99 a month or something very inexpensive like that. And you get the full tracks that you can listen to here streaming. Or, of course, you see the little basket on the side where you can purchase the whole track or the album if you want to do that. But the access, once again, is that which is once you know unprecedented uh, more than you know two, three years, four years ago, which I think is really, really quite amazing. Now we're going to end up, for the sake of time, we're going to end up with uh, I think one of the most interestingly promising applications that I want to show you tonight. And this is one that, uh, when I was introduced to uh, this, actually my colleague Ken, once again, he, he's a master at this technology stuff. He, uh, he's actually done some stuff like this before and, and I, I wanted to get him to tell me a little bit more. We just haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. And that's a technology called augmented reality. How many of you have heard of that term before? Okay, just a few people. Augmented reality is basically where uh, you have overlaid on top of the real world augmented information or additional information. There are a number of science fiction writers that, of course, uh, I, could, I could tell you about um, uh, that, that have incorporated ideas of augmented reality into their work. Werner Vang being one of my favorites, where uh, you know, the, 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 the idea behind his novel called Rainbow's End is basically where uh, a, a gentleman was once had, had Alzheimer's and, of course, a drug has been created, brings him out of that. He wakes up uh, realizing that he's in an entirely different time technologically and his granddaughter is teaching him how to use these new tools. Well, one of those new tools is a set of contact lenses that are connected to every bit of information you can imagine, but that also incorporate augmented reality. And with a series of grunts or blinks or what have you, you can surf the web, very similar to Google Glass. Okay? So we see that these things are coming. I always like to, and I think I mentioned this once before during another presentation, but uh, I always like to tell my friends that are in the sciences, we in the humanities, kind of inform what you do. We, we predict it. We, we give what you do meaning uh, so that it, it actually humanizes the science that you create. Well, this augmented reality application called Erasma, Erasma, I know I'm mispronouncing that, is really quite interesting. And I'd like to show you that because uh, it does some things that will, I think, really bring the classroom to life in some unprecedented ways either with regards to the possibility of, of, uh, of, of enlivening a text, 
the possibility of introducing students to brand new technologies that perhaps they might be able to then take to the workplace with them, the possibility of introducing them to things that will allow them to express themselves very, very differently, as well as the possibility of bringing to life that which, of course, we as professors always have to do, and that is our syllabus. So let's see what this does here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to African American Literature. This semester is, proven, is going to prove to be an amazing one in that, in addition to learning about the wonders of African American literature, you'll also learn about some very, very interesting technologies and how to focus your learning of those technologies on your understanding of the literature that we'll be studying. I can't wait to introduce you to other aspects of this course. I think it'll be one like you've never experienced in the past. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone. You can do that throughout your syllabus. So imagine being able to say, students, you know, go ahead and, and if you've got this application, this free application, hold your, your mobile device up in front of it, and the syllabus will be explained to you in various ways. So imagine, in addition to that, being able to bring textbooks to life. Let's look at this one. In Octavia Butler's novel, Fledgling, Shory is a mystery. She's found alone in the woods, and she appears to be a little black girl with traumatic amnesia and near fatal wounds. But Shory is a 53-year-old vampire with a ravenous hunger for blood, the lost child of an ancient species of, of near immortals who live in dark symbiosis with humanity. Genetically modified, to be able to walk in daylight, Shori now becomes the target of a vast plot to destroy her and her kind. And in the final apocalyptic battle, her survival will depend on whether all humans are bigots or all bigots are human. You've got to read I Oops, it, it just go on. You got to read Octavia Butler's Fledgling. But basically, imagine giving the power of this to students, where they have to maybe do uh, some sort of analysis of a part of the text. What this does is it does image recognition. You record your video. You then take a, a, a snapshot of that which you want to connect to that video, and it does it automatically. It can't be any easier than that. Let's look at this last one here. In the novel by Tana Marie Du, My Soul to Keep, Jessica is an African-American journalist as ambitious as she is bright. Now she's chasing the biggest story of her life that strikes closer to home than she knows. DeWitt is an immortal whose ancient thirst for wisdom leads him to break the first commandment of his kind, not to fall in love. Together, they are about to pay the ultimate price for their ambition and their desire. As you all know, we're about to start reading My Soul to Keep by Tananarive Du. Your assignment is to use this application to add your aura and your comments to this program. I can't wait to see it. Good luck. So as a developer, and we can uh, subscribe to free developer accounts to this, we can string these, these, these comments together so that as students are, are adding to this, we can watch one after the other after the other after the other. That is really quite interesting. Once again, it brings the classroom to life. It engages students on an entirely different level. And it introduces them to new technologies that, once again, are, I think, are going to be very much a part of the future. As I reference Google Glass, pretty soon we're all going to be walking around in glasses where, with a blink, we can recognize who someone is. We can pull up their Facebook account. We can pull up uh, any information about someone, something, or some place right through our glasses. That's not too far off. We all know that's it's coming. These are the alpha versions of many of those applications. So when you look at enhanced communication, when you look at enhancing the, the visuality and the engagement in class, these are just a few of the apps that I think are, are not only very interesting, but if you want to see me about some more, let's definitely talk. And I can show you a whole, I'm, I'm an app junkie, I, I really admit that. Um, but I can show you a whole lot more of some of the things that I think are very, very interesting possibilities in the classroom. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
you very much, Dr. Carter. Are there questions? Oh, yes, here they go. Okay, we'll pass around the talking stick. First of all, I just want to say thank you. That was really insightful, really cool to see where this is going. I think you're, this working so yeah. you're pioneering this. It's very cool. Thank you. Um, one thing, I think you kind of touched on this earlier at the beginning, <clears throat> was the capacity for use of this technology with activism. And um, I think one of the big things that I heard you say that really struck me as um, awesome in general was that um, a lot of these applications can connect to 3G networks in addition to connected to Wi-Fi networks. And I know that a lot of the existing technologies, mobile devices, for example, FaceTime with iPhones um, requires a Wi-Fi connection. And so I think in terms of activism, there's apps that exist right now like Ushahidi, or, um, which require its only textual updates, and so you can get updates of what's happening. It's an activism website. Um, but I think with video streaming, that could really kind of revolutionize what activism means and what it means to relay live, you know, real-time information. So I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think? Well, yes, it already has. We all saw what happened with Arab Spring last year. And that's the only way that because the, uh, the, uh, the governments there had shut down the internet for, for all, you know, sex and, 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 and purposes, the only way that they could get information out was through a cellular network. 3G, and so they were using applications like Ustream, like uh, like uh, um, uh, Google uh, Hangouts. They were using various applications in order to broadcast live or record broadcasts and then send them to various television networks. That's how we found out a lot of the things that were going on over there. So yes, activism is huge. The fact that, well, uh, the new uh, iPhone 5 actually does connect using a 3G network and LTE, but I think you have to uh, have an additional data plan or something like that. So it's getting, it's expensive to do that. Uh, if you're not in a Wi-Fi network, you can run through your data cap very, very, very quickly. But activism is huge. Introducing students to something other than Facebook is so very primary as far as as far as what I want to do um, because I think yeah Facebook is cool and everything for some um, but it's got so many problems that sometimes are not necessarily immediately noticeable. Some of these have issues that we can definitely talk about, but just so that you can you know expand horizons is I think very important here. Please, when I want to look into this, what's the general title of the subject? Is it Humanities Apps or what? It is Digital Humanities. Digital. And it, yes, and if you did a search for Digital Humanities, you'll find a, a plethora of information that will give you even more in-depth uh, essays and presentations and information on how the field is evolving uh, and has evolved over the last several years. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic seeing the Spreecast uh, app, and I was wondering uh, how big a class are you able to handle with that? Uh, I've had up to 130 people listening to a Spreecast broadcast before. Right now, I just have 28 students in my class, and, and usually uh, about maybe, uh, I'd say, 10 or so attend the live sessions. However, when you go back and look at the recordings, which are automatically done, I see that 140, 160 views have been made of various uh, uh, recordings, or listens have been made of various recordings. So in a live session, you're only limited by the limitations of the application. Spreecast, I've seen, you can, you can go in and you can see where you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 people at one time are watching a particular broadcast. And can they um, raise their hand? To yes. Yes, they can. They can request to be on video. You can only have four people on screen at one time, but you know you can you can swap those off as much as you want. So it's very similar to Google Hangouts. I didn't get a chance to show that one today, where you know you've got ten at the bottom, but you can also then, of course, broadcast that to YouTube, and you can embed a YouTube window into any location that you want, so you can virtually have as many viewers as you like using that particular medium as well. Um, one thing I'm curious about, and you made a quick reference to it earlier in the in this well, speech. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm curious about, and you made a, a reference to it earlier, is the problem of the digital divide. In your experience, how have you dealt with this problem of the digital divide, or somebody who isn't as comfortable with these technologies, or aren't as technologically literate, I guess you can say? 
Okay. That's, that's a couple of questions, and, and the first one I'll address is how to make people more comfortable with these technologies. You heard one of the students say he was a little bit leery of all this stuff, and, and when students read my syllabus, sometimes they're like, oh, I'm not tech-oriented or what have you, and I think it's very important that if, uh, if a professor is going to be using any level of technology that is out of the norm, so to speak, that we have to do a bit of hand-holding. We have to definitely walk students through how easy it is, or not necessarily easy, but how not difficult it can be to use these, these technologies. It's a, if it's a button click, if it's this or that, and when students realize that, oh, that wasn't so bad, they then gravitate towards it, as you've seen these students do. So that's one part of it, is, is making sure you have very clear instructions and that you can, you're able to be comfortable with the technology yourself so that you can show others not only that comfort level, but also what to do if they run into any difficulties. I don't know if you saw the, the, the pre-session that I was doing here <laughs> earlier when we had a little problem with getting one of the students' video going. And so, you know, just being able to troubleshoot like that is very important. The second thing, and I think it's very important uh, uh, aspect, is, is that of the divide. I think that divide, in, in my opinion, is, 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 is shrinking just a bit because of the advent of mobile technologies. I think you'll find a number of studies, and I, I'm sorry I can't cite any off the top of my head, but I've seen a number of studies that look at, at, uh, at, at mobile technology shrinking that digital divide. So we have, have students of, of, of lower SES or lower socioeconomic groups that may not necessarily have a laptop but they sure do have a mobile device that they can get online with, that they can update LinkedIn or, or, or not LinkedIn, but um, uh, Facebook with or any of the other social networks. So that connects them in various ways, which is one of the reasons why I'm so very happy that when you look at, at the possibility of broadcasting using mobile technologies, one of the reasons why I do the simulcasting is because some students may not have a, a capable laptop. They may only be on a 3G capable, uh, uh, connection. Well, using the audio broadcast still allows them to engage with the class. So by, 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 by simulcasting and making your, your broadcasts, if you choose to do that, available in multiple formats, multiple bandwidths, I think is also shrinking that divide just a bit. Okay. Now, when we start talking about things like augmented reality, I mean, that does take a little bit more horsepower. Uh, and I think it's important that we, of course, provide the print version of that and, and maybe even a desktop version of that. There is something that you can do with this uh, that allows you to hold it up in front of your webcam and you get sort of the same kind of experience. So I think that's going to take a little bit longer when you start, you know, sort of inching up with regards to the capabilities or, you know, the, the technology. Um, but I think it's going, to, it's going to continue to shrink, particularly as, as quickly as these mobile devices are getting more and more powerful. To stay with the augmented reality issue and the Aurasma? Yes. Or, okay. Is that something to which everyone in the class, for example, would subscribe or, and, and that connects them, that's enough? Yes, they will download the application and then they will then be able to subscribe to my sort of master aura, so to speak. And then they will then be able to add their auras uh, to my master one. And theirs will then be sequentially added so that we can actually see them play sequentially. Perfect. So yes, it's just a matter of making sure they have either a, an iOS or an Android device. If they don't, I'm hoping that, uh, what was the organization that the students can borrow equipment from here? Gear to go. Gear to go. I'm not sure if they have any tablet devices. They might. This was all done on my, on my, on my iPad uh, two hours ago. So it's not difficult to do. It's just a matter of making sure that, that they have the, the equipment to do so. All right, just to root it then, if, for example, you were to receive back from a student a written uh, composition, whatever it is, mm -hmm. in which the student embeds, sorry, the other way, you embed your comments yes. concerning that, he then or she receiving it could also say, what are you nuts about the first thing you said? <laughs> I really meant this, and that dialogue yes. could continue yes. in a video format in a way that I think is so private and doesn't expose anyone to class criticism about it. It just seems like such an extraordinary uh, opportunity for real dialogue without time restrictions. 
I couldn't agree with you more. Wow. And, and that was just one of the applications. There are several others that allow you to do some very similar things with, with desktop technology. So once again, those that don't have a tablet or a mobile device, there's a, a really cool application called VoiceThread that does basically the same thing, that allows you to post a comment and students can comment back using their voice or video. So these kinds of technologies are out there. They're not very expensive or they are free. It's just a matter of awareness and then taking the, the chance to try to incorporate those in some interesting way into your class. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the chronicle of our education in the past few weeks has been running successful stories of uh, and not so successful stories and some cases of struggling <laughs> programs uh, that have to do with online teaching. What's your uh, what's your recommendation or what's your advice to skeptics of uh, online of online education? Well, I, I think that uh, a, a lot of those stories are really focusing on MOOCs, uh, Massive Online Open Courses, or Massive Open Online Courses, M-O-O-C is the acronym. Um, and I think that when you start to look at these massive courses, I mean 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people that are, that are watching a, an asynchronous uh, uh, you know, a number of videos, and then and then taking care of coursework, and then trying to you know maybe uh, complete various assignments. Um, I think that's part of what universities are struggling with. But they see the revenue potential that is connected to those kinds of online classes. I think some of the other struggles are, of course, the attrition rate of students that sometimes get off task. And those of us that have taken online classes before, you know that if you get behind in that first few weeks, then trying to catch up with the mounting assignments, everything due by Friday midnight or whatever the case, and then you got another set of assignments that are due. If you miss a couple of those Fridays, it, it makes it very difficult uh, to catch up. And so the attrition rate for those students that may have some time management issues or that may be working and taking 18 credits but thought they could handle an online class because they thought it was going to be easy or, or whatever the case might be. I think that is also one of those issues and, 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 and sometimes can be a struggle. Um, I think that, that, that some universities are struggling with the idea of, of online education being a huge revenue generator, but yet when you look at, at the quality of some of those online courses, they may not necessarily pass the litmus test, so to speak, because they sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, they tend to turn professors into graders. I mean, we, we, you know, we put our stuff up there and we, we grade information that comes back. Once we've recorded that set of videos, that's the extent of some of our teaching, sometimes. We have very little interaction, real-time interaction with our students unless they come in for office hours or unless we schedule you know, the chat session or maybe something like that that allows us to really engage students. So that's one of those struggles. So there are a lot of struggles that, that are wrapped up in this, the, you know, what some universities are, are dealing with regarding online education. Who's managing that online education or that program is also very important. And, and so it, it, it takes a committee, it takes a group of faculty members who are teaching online education or are online courses, I think, to be a part of that conversation. Not necessarily something that's from the top down where you might not necessarily have as many administrators that are really engaged in that kind of thing, but yet that are making some of the decisions. One quick question line on the way out here, perhaps. But um, I struggle with, I love all this, and I, you know, thank you. <laughs> and I'm fascinated, and I have to run right home and play. Uh, <laughs> on the other side, and probably with my administrator hat, who owns this? What, the intellectual property is the question. Uh, when we use all of these wonderful apps that are developed by other people, and are either free or cheap, and then who owns what we, when our students, and our university works with on them? That's a really good question, and it depends on the organization or the application that you're using. Some of those EULAs, those, um, what does EULA stand for? In-use and license agreement. In-use and license agreement, thank you. Some of those EULAs say that the content creator is the sole owner right. of that content. 
Some of them, however, say that, yeah, you might own it, but we can do anything we want to with it for publicity or for advertising or whatever the case might be. Some say that, well, you don't really own it uh, because it's on our servers and because, you know, we're the ones that are hosting it, so to speak. So, you know, even though you can take it down if you want, we still got a copy of that. And if we want to use it at any time, so, so it's a matter of choosing your applications very carefully and a matter of reading that EULA, that end user license agreement, and making Making sure that it's it's something that would be appropriate and protected. Guarding students' information is also a very important concern. I mean, if students are doing presentations online, how is that protected? How are they protected? That's that's a huge concern uh, that that I think we need to think about. Um, keeping in mind that you know when you when you start outsourcing. That, of course, opens up a whole new can of worms that, of course, administrators would need to make some of those or help make some of those decisions. However, when you insource it and, and, and run these things off of a local server, we've got even more problems, whether it be bandwidth or, or even access or maintenance. I mean, you know, so, so these aren't easy questions to answer. Uh, the easiest way to do it is some of these applications where you just kind of do it and maybe ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but so those are, those are you know, huge issues that thank can't be so answered much. really quickly. And obviously forgiveness whenever possible. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Uh,